So, to tell the story from the beginning, more than 2,000 years ago, like you say, Britain was inhabited by the Celts. Many different tribes of Celts called Britons, like this, all around. And their culture was rich, they had bright clothing, many carbon, wood and stone and metalwork, they had art, but no writing. So instead, they spoke and sang. <coughs> they told stories, they wrote songs, they wrote poems. And all of their history, their gods, their laws, was passed down in these stories and poems and songs by mouth. The whole culture was held in the spoken language. And those people who knew those songs and stories were very important. They had very high status. They were called bards, singers, poets. Many people came from all around the country to hear a famous bard sing. And there were other people called druids. They were like priests, like Shinto priests. The religion then was very similar to Shinto. They believed in many gods from the sea, the sky, the earth, the trees, the air, the birds, the animals, everything. Everything has a god. And so these people knew the lords and the stories as well. These are some of the gods of ancient Britain, pagan religion. So, in the earliest of these stories from Britain, King Arthur would have been a god, not a man. He had special powers, like Excalibur. People would come to him for help, for advice. He had a different name then. It wasn't Arthur, a different name. But, 2,000 years ago, the Romans came to Britain, and they conquered the country. They united it under their leadership. One king, the emperor in Rome. They brought roads, engineering, buildings, laws, gods, stories, and writing. The Romans had writing. They changed the language. They changed the stories. They changed the gods. So, no more Druids. They killed the Druids different religion. They couldn't have it. Many of the old stories from Britain were lost, gone. And they brought their own gods, the Roman gods. They taught the Britons to worship the Roman gods. The Romans stayed in Britain for 400 years, changing the language, changing the stories, changing the writing. Their culture blended with the stories of the Britons. And Arthur is in fact a Roman name, Arcturus. It's a Roman name. Later, the Romans brought Christianity. Christianity came to Britain from the Romans. In Christianity, there is only one God. Now, Arthur cannot be a God. He must change. Now he is a man in the stories. There is only one God, Jesus Christ. All the old stories change. Not gods, heroes, kings, legendary warriors, magic men, and witches, but no gods. Here's one example. In the earliest poems, Arthur is mentioned as a kind of magical hero. He goes on adventures to strange lands, steals magical objects, helps people from escape from dangerous creatures. And in this poem, called Prevei Anuv, a raid on the other world, he goes to the other side. The ancient Britons believed there is this world and the other world alongside, where all the dead people live, all the gods, all the magic, somewhere just beyond our sight, you can go there and meet the magic people. So they told this story about Arthur going to steal a magic cup from the prince of the other world. And here it is in Old Welsh. 
Lleddyf llawch lliawch i ddawr y dyrchyd, ac yn llawl lle mi nawg i ddeud ewyd, a rhag drws porf i ffer, lle gyrr llosgyd. A phan eithaf ni gan arthur, traffer llethyd, na'n saith ni ddyraeth o gair fedwyd. In English, the flashing sword of Lleoch was lifted, and in the hand of Lle Minawg it was left. Before the gates of hell the lamps were burning, and when we went with Arthur, brilliant difficulty, except seven, none returned from Caer In this poem, the story is not complete. We don't know the whole story only small references, but it's a very dark story, a strange story, it's a warning. Many, many people, three ships, went with Arthur to take this magic cup, and only seven men returned. Many died. In this story, Arthur is not a god, he's a king, but he goes to magical places to steal holy objects from strange people. In other stories, he's treated like a god. Arthur is a kind of great figure in the background, and sometimes other characters go to him for help and advice. Sometimes he will give them a magical object, or he will grant a wish, or he will send his knights with them to help them. And they will have special powers, invisibility, speaking many languages. So, I will now tell you one of these very old stories where God, uh, Arthur is a kind of god, kind of king, kind of god, with special powers. This is an old story from 1800 years ago called Kiluch and Olwen. In the days of mist, when there are heroes, and dragons and giants around the land. Kilid, son of Prince Celadon, married Prince Amlaw's daughter, Golivi, and they had a son. But Golivi became ill when she was pregnant. There was a fog in her mind. She could not think clearly, and she became scared. She refused to go into any house or any building, so long as she was pregnant. And she went out, away, into the country, into the forests. And in the course of time, she gave birth to her son, among pigs, hiding in the forest. And so, she named him Kiluch, which means, hidden among pigs. Now, she brought her son, Kiluch, back to the castle back to his father, but she was still ill. She knew she would die. And as she was dying, she made her husband make a promise. She told him, I will die soon. Don't remarry. Don't marry again until you see two thorns growing on my grave. And he agreed. I won't marry until I see two thorns on your grave. But she gave instructions to her loyal servant to cut the grass on her grave every morning. <laughs> <laughs> and so she died, and the servant cut the grass on her grave every morning. And the king, Kiluch's father, sent a servant every afternoon to see what was growing on the grave. Nothing. Every afternoon, nothing. For seven long years. And meanwhile, Kiluch, the baby boy, could not come inside. So ashamed and so sad was his father, he would not let his son into the castle. He sent him away to live with the horse master and his family for seven years. And eventually, his mother's servant forgot to cut the grass <laughs> and plants began to grow. And one day the servant went to the king and said, Sir, sir, 
There are plants growing on the grave. A rose and two thorns. And Kelodon knew it was time to take a new wife. And so he did. Now, when she learned that her new husband had a son, Kiluch was summoned to meet his new stepmother, only seven years old. And she said, you must marry my daughter, so she will be queen when you are old. And he said, but I'm too young. I'm only seven years old. And she became very angry. And she cast a spell of magic on him. And a curse. She said, I swear this destiny upon you. You will never touch a woman until you win the hand of Olwe, daughter of Aspadade Penkau, the great giant, greatest of all giants. Olwe was the most beautiful woman in all of Britain. But her father was a fearsome giant, Aspadaden Penkau, and everyone was afraid of him. But as the spell came over seven-year-old Kilo, he felt, despite his young heart, a love for this woman who he had never seen. He went to his father and he begged him, please, father, I've never asked you for anything, but I must marry Olwe, the daughter of Aspadaden, Penkau, chief of all giants. Please tell me, how can I find her? And his father was happy, and he said, Oh good, go and visit your cousin, King Arthur, and ask him to cut your hair, and he will tell you where you can find Olwe daughter of Aspadade, Pankau. And so he did. Kiluch went out on his journey. He wore a purple cloak with a golden apple at each corner, a gold-hilted sword with a cross inlaid with ivory on the blade, a war horn around his neck, and a spear of silver so sharp it could cut the wind itself. His horse was dappled grey, only four years old, and it trod so lightly not even the grass underneath would bend, and not a single hair on his head would move in the wind. And so he went to the court of King Arthur at Camelot. He knocked on the door, and inside a great host of knights, men and women, are gathered. He came into the hall in his purple cloak with his gold sword, and he said, I am Kiluch, son of Prince Caladon, by Golaviv, my mother, daughter of Prince Anlauth. And so you are, said King Arthur. Welcome, you are my cousin. And in the ritual, that binds the ties of kinship and family. The king of all Britain cut the boy's hair with a pair of golden scissors and a silver comb. And then he said to King, We are family. And just as if you were one of my knights, you may ask me one thing, and if I can give it to you, I will. Kiluk said, I need only one thing. I must marry Olwe, daughter of Aspadaden Penkau, the chief of all giants. Please tell me, where can I find her? King Arthur said, I don't know, but let's go with you. And he gave six of his knights to Kiluk. Sir Kai, the strong, who could go for nine days and nights without sleep, and breathe underwater. Sir Bedwin, the swift, who had only one hand, but was faster than any other warrior in Britain, except for Arthur, and his lance was more powerful than nine opposing lances. 
Sir Gwalchmai, the faithful, Arthur's nephew, he never returned from a quest without completing it. Sir Gurir of Tongues, who could speak any language known to gods or animals, and Sir Manu the Subtle, whose charm of illusion could turn them all invisible. Magic. So the six of these knights went with King Arthur and the young boy Kil to find Olwen, daughter of Aspadadin Benkau. <coughs> they went out together across the plains, across the mountains, until they met a shepherd tending to a vast flock of sheep that went from one horizon to the other as far as the eye could see, countless sheep. This man, though he was poor, welcomed King Arthur, for he hated Aspadaden Penkau, chief of all the giants. This man and his wife had 23 sons, and all of them had been killed by the giant. He told them there was no man who dared to ask for the hand of Olwen, the daughter of the giant, who had survived. All of them had died. But the girl, Olwen, was <coughs> friends with the shepherd's wife. And every day he would visit his wife, or she would visit his wife, and leave a ring of gold. Kiluch asked the man, he asked the shepherd, can we contact Olwen? Can your wife ask her to come so that we can meet her? And he said, okay, let's go. They went to the shepherd's house and come she did, Olwen, in a robe of flame-colored silk with a torque of gold around her neck, studded with rubies and emeralds. Her hair was fairer than the flowers of spring. Her skin was whiter than the foam of the wave, her eyes brighter than the jewels of heaven. And wherever she stepped, four white flowers would grow out of the earth. And so she was named Olwen, the most beautiful woman in all the land. As soon as he saw her, Kiluch knew this was the woman he was looking for, and his heart swelled in his chest so much he was afraid it would burst. He said, oh, maiden, you are the one I have been searching for all my life, all my many days and nights. Come away with me, lest they speak ill of us. She said, I cannot go. I cannot go without the will of my father, Aspaladen Penkau, chief of all giants. There is a curse on my father a magic spell that says he will die on the day that I am married. Ask him, ask my father for my hand in marriage. He will tell you what he needs from you. And if you give it to him, you can have me. But if you fail, you will surely die. And when Olwen went back to her father's house, Kiluch, King Arthur, and the six knights followed her in secret. Eventually, they were in the great hall of the castle, confronted by the giant himself. He was so tall, his head was up in the rafters above the light, and they could barely see him. The torches were lighted on the walls, guttering smoke up into the ceiling. They stepped into the middle of the hall, and Arthur spoke. The greeting of heaven and man to you, Aspaladen Penkau, chief of all giants. And who are you? <laughs> Came the rumbling voice from up in the darkness. We have come to ask for the hand of your daughter, Olwen, for Kiluch, the son of Prince Kalada. Where are my pages? Where are my servants? Come, raise the forks above my eyelids, so that I may see my son-in-law. And servants came rushing 
from the sides of the hall with two ladders up to the shoulders of the giants. And they ran with two wooden forks to push up the eyelids of the giant so he could see them. Who is it that desires the hand of my daughter? It is I. Kiluk steps forward, the young boy. It is I. The giant looks down at him. Do as I ask, and when I have my price, you will have my daughter. You have my word, said Kiluk. Name your price. The giant points out of the window. See that hill? Plow it, plant it with seeds. In one day, the grain must grow. In one day, it must ripen. Of that grain, I will make the wine for my daughter's wedding. That will be easy for me, though you may not think so says the little boy. You may think it easy, but that land is so wild. Nothing can be ploughed except by a Python, god of the sea, and he will not come of his own free will. You cannot make him. And so the giant set 39 tasks. Each one Kiluk said, that's easy, and the giant said, no, and made it harder, each task harder than the last, each one more impossible. And finally, for his daughter's wedding feast, he wanted his hair cut and his beard cut, and his hair and beard were wild and tangled, a little like my friend here. <laughs> he said, In all the world, no comb, no razor, no scissors can cut my hair or beard, except for those beneath the ears of Tulchchulf, the legendary boar. And he will not give them to you. Tulchchulf, once upon a time, was the king of Ireland. But a great curse was laid upon him, and he was turned into a boar, a wild pig, a huge animal that ran from one side of the country to the other, leaving havoc, devastation in his wake. And between his ears, there was a golden comb a golden pair of scissors and a golden razor. Aspadaden Pankau, chief of giants, needed these to cut his hair and cut his beard for the wedding of his daughter. And away Kiluch went with King Arthur and his knights. Thirty-nine tasks there were. Thirty-eight stories I can't tell you today. We don't have time. <laughs> but the last of these is the hunt for Turk truth. For that, said King Arthur, I will need all of the knights of Britain, France, and the southern countries. And they set sail together for Ireland to find Turk truth and his sons. Eventually, they found the boar. His sons were the size of horses and Turchtruith himself was bigger and stronger and faster than any beast any of them had yet seen. They fought for two days and nights. They destroyed one-fifth of Ireland, but the knights could not overcome the boar Turchtruith. King Arthur himself fought the boar alone for nine days and nights, but still they could not claim the comb, the razor, the scissors from between the ears of Turk Truth. So, King Arthur sent his knight, Gurhir of Tongues, to speak to the boar. 
for he could speak any language known to God or beasts. Sir Goodhue became a bird and he flew to one of the boar's sons. He said, by God, if you can speak, will you come and speak to King Arthur? We will not. It's bad enough that we are cursed to be this way without you chasing and fighting us. Leave us alone. So Goodhue said, we seek the golden scissors, the golden comb, the golden razor from between the ears of your father took truth. And the son said, by my beard, you will not have these things. They are precious to us. And we will go to Arthur's country and we will do all the damage that we can. So Tolkhtroy and his three sons went to Wales. They went to Britain. Arthur and his knights followed them on the ships, followed the trail of devastation and death the Boers left behind. They went from Morn to Havren to Pendrel and saw flooded fields, ruined cities, grieving families. Each time the party of knights drew close, Turkchuif would fight and kill them. Arthur himself chased the boar to the top of Betos Mountain and down into the Amman Valley and along the river. And there they killed the boar's first son. The battle raged, they fought to the death. Another of Trudhtruid's sons fell on the Black Mountain in Brecon. And still, Arthur and the knights could not take the golden comb, the golden razor, and the golden scissors. Looking. With one son still alive, Trudhtruid fought Arthur's knights all along the valley, up to the Tony, and back again along the Amman's banks. And there, they killed the last son. Tulkhtroif ran south towards the river Severn. Kai the Strong caught the bill bull by his feet and tipped him upside down into the river, plunged him into the water where Bedwyr the Swift pulled the scissors from between the boar's ears. Arthur himself swung Excalibur and cut the razor from between the boar's ears. And finally Kiluch, on his grey horse, rode lightly along the waves and drove his spear into the neck of the boar. And he took the golden seals. All of them were exhausted, but they had their three treasures. And they went together to Arthur's castle in Tintagel. And there they rested. Finally, they went back to the castle of Aspanadem Penkau, the chief of all giants, all of them together with Olwen at the side. Arthur and his knights went with them. They presented all the treasures they had found on their travels, including the golden comb, the golden razor, and the golden scissors. And Kiluch said to the giant, Now, may I have your daughter's hand in marriage? The giant looked at the mountain of treasure in the middle of the hall and the golden scissors in the hands of the boy. Let me examine these. Come back tomorrow and you shall have her. They turned to leave. Aspaladen seized a poisoned dart, one of three, from beside his throne and he threw it at their backs. Sir Bedwin, the swift, turned and caught it, and he flung it back towards the giant, and it pierced him through his knee, causing a great wound. As they left the castle, they could hear the giant screaming at the top of his lungs, with every step I take, I curse you, kill. The next day, they came back at dawn. Give Kiluch the hand of your daughter, Olwen, said King Arthur. The giant looked down at them. 
her four great-grandmothers and her four great-grandfathers still live. I must ask them for their permission. Come back tomorrow and you shall have her. Very well, said King Arthur. And they turned to leave. And the giant took up <coughs> the second poison dart and threw it at their backs. So Menu the subtle turned and caught it and threw it back at the giant and it pierced him in his chest. As they turned to leave the castle, they could hear the giant screaming, With every breath I take, I curse you, kill. <coughs> On the third day, they came back to the castle, and many people from around the country who had grievances with the giant came to see what would happen. Unless you wish to die, do not attack me again, said the giant. Servants, come. Raise the forks and my eyelids, that I may see my son-in-law. And the servants came from the sides of the hall, up the ladders to the giant's shoulders, and along with the forks to lift up the giant's eyelids so he could see them. And as his eyelids lifted, the giant took the last poison dart and threw it, and Kiluk <coughs> caught it and threw it back through the giant's eye and it came out the back of his head and pinned him to the wall. The giant screamed but all the knights of Arthur's troop ran forward and grabbed the arms and the legs of the giant and pinned him down and Kiluch took the golden razor, the golden scissors and the golden comb and he shaved the giant. He shaved all the hair off the giant's head. Are you shaved now? he asked. I am, replied the giant. And is your daughter mine? She is, replied the giant. Though you should not thank me, thank Arthur. By my will, you would not have her, for with her I lose my life. And at that, Sir Kai took his sword and cut the giant's head from his body. He took the head out of the castle and placed it on a spike in front of the gates. That night, there was a feast. Olwen and Kiluch were married, and she was his wife for as long as they lived. King Arthur returned to his court. The knights went back to their homes in each part of Britain, and the country was free and peaceful again. And that is how Kiluch won Olwen. Thank you.